Good morning. It is Monday. Hope you are all doing well and staying at home and staying safe. Today we remember Hans Nielsen Hauge, renewer of the church, 1824. This day was actually yesterday, but we're going to commemorate him today. So uh, just a couple of announcements that you know, if you are in need of any essential supplies, the church phone office is going to continue to be checked. So you can call the church office at 762-8641. Someone will be in the office nine to noon to Monday through Thursday. Now that may change as this uh, shelter in place order goes on. If we can Get, if all three of us, if all three of our staff can work from home, that's what we're going to try to do. Uh, we're already trying to do that as much as possible. Also, uh, but so you, if you need any help getting supplies, if you can't get out and or do not want to get out, and who could blame you right now, uh, you can certainly uh, call the church office, send us a Facebook message, you know, send me an email. Uh, there, there are plenty of ways to get in touch with us. My email, by the way, is pastordavidshalom at gmail.com. Now, Pastor David Shalom is all one word. So I hope you're doing well. I hope you're safe. I hope you're finding ways to deal with uh, being at home right now. Thank you so much for joining us yesterday virtually for our worship online. That thank you for your tremendous response. Uh, it really does give us courage and motivation when we see you online and we see you joining in uh, the, the, as well as, well, it, as, as church uh, dispersed, you know, it, it really does give us the courage to keep going. So thank you. So for Hans Nielsen Hauge, renewer of the church 1824, I love that we're talking about Hauge today because he was such an important person in lay and empowering lay leadership in the church. Now in the Lutheran church in North America, now it's uh, when you say that was a Haugean congregation, that's code for they treated their pastor like a hired hand, which is not really what Hauge was after. How he was about empowering lay leadership. Um, in Norway, the clergy seat often regarded that as an erosion of their rights and privileges. So we'll read his biography here. Hans Nielsen Hauge was born April 3rd, 1771 on a farm in Rolfsuen in southeastern Norway, about 50 miles from Oslo. His father, Niels Mikkelsen, was a farmer and the farm was known as Haugegård, from which Hans Nielsen took his surname. The, the family was deeply concerned with their Christian faith, having regular family prayers and daily Bible reading, and from time to time attending lay religious meetings in the village. As a young boy, Hauge thought deeply about religious matters and was troubled with a fear that he would not go to heaven when he died. This fear intensified through several experiences that brought him face to face with death. Hauge never had much formal education, but he became very skilled in practical tasks such as carpentry and the repair of mechanical devices. Acting as village handyman and helping on the family farm, Hauge also became experienced in business affairs, and all his life he was not only able to support himself while engaging in religious work, but also was able to assist others in their everyday affairs. He worked for a time in Frederikstad, where the temptations he encountered made him aware of the conflict between God and the world. As a young man, his first interest was religion. He read deeply in Lutheran catechetical and devotional literature and participated in the worship of the parish church and in private prayer meetings. He spoke to others so frequently about their faith that his companions nicknamed him Holy. His parents called him home to work on their farm, and it was while working there on April 5th, 1796, that he had a mystical experience that set the course of his life. He felt suddenly at peace about his own salvation and felt sure of his call to preach. He launched a one-man preaching crusade 
beginning in his own community and then traveling throughout Norway and visiting Denmark in 1800. He also wrote about his faith, eventually producing some 30 books, of which the best known is his Reiser og Vi... No, that's not going to happen. Sorry, I don't have enough Norwegian to know how to pronounce that. In English, it's Journeys and Important Events. The central concept of his preaching and writing was what he called the living faith, the personal commitment to the Lord that transforms the believer's life. Haugi encountered stern opposition, for it was thought unprecedented that a farm boy should teach religion, an area traditionally reserved for the clergy. He was in violation of the ordinance of 13th January, 1741, which required that the local pastor be informed of the time and place of any religious meetings to be held within his parish. The pastor was obliged to attend and had authority to forbid such meetings. Only a few people were permitted to gather. The meetings had to be held during the day. Men and women were to meet in separate places, and it was forbidden that lay people travel about and preach. The church authorities were opposed to Hauge because some thought that he laid too much stress on good works, the civil authorities were opposed to him because some feared he would stir up a peasant's revolt. Let's be honest. People, the clergy were afraid of him because he threatened their sense of authority and prestige. So let's continue on. It sounds like something from the Gospels. Hmm. Anyway, after repeated arrests, he was taken into custody in 1804 to be held for full investigation, and his imprisonment lasted 10 years. In prison, in the absence of Christian fellowship, Haugi's faith weakened. In 1809, he was released from prison to work on a project to extract salt from seawater. War with England had cut off supplies of salt by ship. He was arrested again, although he was permitted more freedom than before. In 1811, he was permitted to move to a small farm just outside Christiana, now, now that, that's called Oslo today, Christiana, called Bakahaugen. In December 1813, he was sentenced to two years of hard labor and the costs of the trial for breaking the ordinance of 13th January and for invectives against the clergy. In January 27th, on January 27th, 1850, Haugi married Andrea Nihus, the housekeeper at his farm, she died not long afterward, leaving an infant son, Andreas. In 1817, Haugi married Ingeborg Oldsdaughter, who bore him three sons, all of whom died young. Haugi moved to another farm, Brettvelt, where he was visited by friends, among whom now were some bishops. His health broken after his long ordeal, Haugi died at 4 a.m. on March 29, 1824. He is buried in the cemetery at Acker Church in Oslo, where his grave is marked. He lived in the Lord, he died in the Lord, and by the grace of Christ, he partakes of salvation. Since Haugi's influence in Norway was at its peak during the period of greatest Norwegian immigration to America, the Haugian spirit was one of the mainstreams of Norwegian-American Lutheranism. It was an important force in the growth of the church and in deepening its spiritual life, particularly that of the laity. And for this reason, Haugi appears on the calendar in the Lutheran Book of Worship and Evangelical Lutheran Worship. The Haugi and Lutheran Synod, established in 1846, merged in 1917 with other Norwegian Lutheran bodies. A few churches in North America are named for Haugi. His legacy is certainly long-lasting here in the United States. Take a moment to repair our hearts for worship. Our psalm today is Psalm 46. We will read it together. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth should change, though the mountains shake in the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble with its tumult. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the Most High. God is in the midst of the city. It shall not be moved. 
God will help it when the morning dawns. The nations are in an uproar. The kingdoms totter. He utters his voice. The earth melts. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Come, behold the works of the Lord. See what desolations he has brought on the earth. He makes war cease to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the shields with fire. Be still and know that I am God. I am exalted among the nations. I am exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Our reading today is from 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 11 through 23. For no one can lay any foundation other than the one that has been laid. That foundation is Jesus Christ. Now, if anyone builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, the work of each builder will become visible. For the day will disclose it, because it will be revealed with fire, and the fire will test what sort of work each has done. If what has been built on the foundation survives, the builder will receive a reward. If the work is burned up, the builder will suffer loss. The builder will be saved, but only as through fire. Do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's Spirit dwells in you? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy that person. For God's temple is holy, and you are that temple. Do not deceive yourselves. If you think that you are wise in this age, you should become fools so that you may become wise. For the wisdom of, the world, of this world is foolishness with God. For it is written, He catches the wise in their craftiness, and again, the Lord knows the thoughts of the wise, that they are futile. So let no one boast about human leaders, for all things are yours, whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world or life or death or the present or the future, all belong to you, and you belong to Christ, and Christ belongs to God. We'll get to that in a moment, that hymn, that's a great hymn, but we have a devotional here from, we have a reading from Hauge's autobiography, May 5th, 1796. Hauge writes, the desire to please God grew more and more. In prayer to him, I would kneel in heartfelt unworthiness because of the great, heartfelt unworthiness of the great goodness he had shown me ashamed because I had not served the Lord as I ought. Sometimes I fell on my knees and prayed Almighty God for the sake of his Son to establish me on the spiritual rock, Christ Jesus. For I believed that even the gates of hell would be powerless against me. I called upon the God of my salvation to reveal his Son's love in me and grant me his Holy Spirit, to expose my wretchedness and impotence, and teach me the way I should walk in order to follow in the footsteps of Christ. One day while I was working outside under the open sky, I sang from memory the hymn, Jesus, I long for thy blessed communion. I had just sung the second verse. Mightily strengthen my spirit within me, that I may learn what thy spirit can do. O oh, take thou captive each passion and win me. Lead thou and guide me my whole journey through. All that I am and possess I surrender, if thou alone in my spirit mayest dwell. Everything yield thee, O Saviour most tender. Thou, only thou, canst my sadness dispel. At this point, my mind became so exalted that I was not aware of, nor can I express what took place in my soul, for I was beside myself. As soon as I came to my senses, I was filled with regret that I had not served this loving, transcendentally good God. 
Now it seemed to me that nothing in this world was worthy of any regard, that my soul experienced something supernatural, divine, and blessed, that there was a glory that no tongue can utter, that I remember as clearly as it had happened only a few days ago. And now it is nearly twenty years since the love of God visited me so abundantly. Nor can anyone argue this away from me, for I know all the good that followed in my spirit from that hour, especially a deep burning love to God and my neighbor. I know that I received an entirely changed mind, a sorrow for sin, and a desire that other people should become partakers with me of the same grace. I know that I was given a special desire to read the Holy Scriptures, especially Jesus' own teachings. At the same time, I received new light to understand the Word and to bring together the teachings of all men of God to one focal point, that Christ has come for our salvation, that we should by His Spirit be born again, repent, and be sanctified more and more in accord with God's attributes to serve the triune God alone, in order that our souls may be refined and prepared for eternal blessedness. It was as if I saw the whole world submerged in evil. I grieved over this, I grieved much over this, and prayed God that he would withhold punishment so that some might repent. Now I wanted very much to serve God. I asked him to reveal to me what I should do. The answer echoed in my heart. You shall confess my name before the people, exhort them to repent and seek me while I may be found and call upon me while I am near, and touch their hearts that they may turn from darkness to light. We're going to sing an old Norwegian hymn, In Heaven Above. Many of you will know this. I had to learn this the other day because I did not know it. Believe it or not. In heaven above, in heaven above, where God our Father dwells, how boundless there the blessedness, no tongue its greatness tells. Their face to face and full and free, the ever-living God we see. Our God, the Lord of hosts, in heaven above, in heaven above, what glory deep and bright, the splendor of the noonday sun, Rose pale before its light. The mighty sun that goes not down, Before whose face clouds never frown, Is God the Lord of hosts. In heaven above, in heaven above, no tears of pain are shed, for nothing there can fade or die. Life's fullness round is spread. And like an ocean joy overflows, and with immortal mercy glows, our God, the Lord of hosts.
in heaven above, in heaven above. God has a joy prepared, which mortal ear has never heard, nor mortal vision shared, which never entered mortal thought, in mortal dreams was never sought, O God, the Lord of hosts. What a beautiful hymn. Let us pray for the church, the world, and for all of those in need. Lord Jesus, today we pray in this time where we are a dispersed church for lay readers and preachers of the gospel. We know that in this time that it is going to be more that it is the pre, that the proclamation of your gospel is more than ever dependent on those who are not called to word and sacrament or word and service in your congregation. Remind us that we have all been made priests and into a royal people by, your, by the blood of your Son, Jesus Christ, and in our baptism. We pray for all of those persecuted for the exercise of their faith, for those in other, uh, in other countries that, so, that cannot preach or congregate freely, for those who are persecuted from within their own faith. For confidence and courage, uh, for confidence in your saving promises, for, faith, for knowledge and faith that you are immutable and your promises are immutable and unchangeable. For a deep and spiritual life, that, we, that your spirit may call us and draw us nearer to you for continued growth in faith by your grace alone. We pray for all leaders of this nation, for, and we thank you for the revised guidelines that have just come out that will surely save lives. Uh, we thank you for that. We thank you for good we thank you for the gift of good government when it does when it does bring work as it should. We thank you for those who are local leaders and who are dealing with this in the best way that they can. We pray for all health care workers, for all grocery store workers, for all of those whose work is essential for those who have to turn on a dime, those who do not know where their next paycheck is going to come from or where their next meal is going to come from. We pray for all those who are sick, for those who have been, who have, uh, who have, are suffering from COVID-19 and for the person that has recently tested positive in COVID-19, for COVID-19, we wish for that person to have a speedy recovery. We pray for, and we finally, Lord, we pray for ourselves as your church, as a con, as that we may be, that we may be more the church now than we ever have been before, dispersed to our own homes, that we may find creative ways of loving and serving you and our neighbor. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. 
For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. Let us pray. Gracious and loving Father, when the zeal and love of your church grow cold, you stir the hearts of your people by sending them men and women to preach repentance and renewal. In your mercy, grant that your church, inspired by the example of your servant Hans Nielsen Hauge, may never be destitute of such proclamation in the reality of your kingdom. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit bless you today and always. God be with you, be safe, and I will be broadcasting from the church office tomorrow.